for joining with us this evening, those in the auditorium and those watching live stream. Those in the auditorium, please take a songbook, turn to page 143, 143, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And let's stand together and let's sing these verses out as Brother Jared comes and leads us in singing, page 143, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a full taste of glory divine. Here is salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. Thank you for joining with us this evening and again those live streaming and let's have a word of prayer lord thank you for this beautiful day you've given us the opportunity you've given us to meet this morning and now this evening we ask dear god your blessings upon the service and may glory and honor be brought unto thee and uh, may the saints of god be edified may hearts be touched for we pray in jesus name Amen. Amen. You may be seated and take your songbook and turn to page 125, 125, The Solid Rock, page 125, as Brother Jared comes and leads us in singing this evening once again. Christ the 
And Lord willing, we plan to live stream once again Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Then also, those in the auditorium, if you choose and you can help uh, with the ministry of the local church, we have an offering plate uh, in the front of the church on the organ. And then those watching live stream, uh, we thank many of you for your generosity in giving and helping the ministry of this local church. And the address is appearing on the screen now. First Baptist Church, 235 High Street, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, 08861, attention financial secretary. Then once again, uh, I want to announce every Saturday morning at 1030, we have church-wide soul winning. Those who uh, choose to come and participate, uh, we really appreciate that. We have a great time getting out the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We're going to have another song, then we're going to look into God's word this evening. So those in the auditorium, if you would take a songbook and turn to page 227, 227, Saved by the Blood. Let's stand together, those in the auditorium and those uh, live streaming. Uh, you can sing along as the words appear on the screen. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Save, save, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the Thank you for this opportunity once again. And Holy Spirit, take the word, minister to each and every heart. Fill me with thy spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and I'm just going to read one verse, and then we're going to just get right into the message. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 11. Ephesians 6, verse number 11. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God 
that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now this comes from the book of Ephesians. And I just want to just mention a few things concerning the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians gives the believers what we would call exalted position. That is the believer's exaltation or position in Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you are positioned in Jesus Christ. That's salvation. And uh, then the blessings of the believer uh, come because of our position in Jesus Christ. And that's the first three chapters uh, in the book of Ephesians. Then, in the last three chapters of the book of Ephesians, exhortation is given to the believer. Now, it's talking about the believer being encouraged to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to please God and to serve God. And first, in the last three chapters of Ephesians, uh, there's a general exhortation, or let me say more than one, general exhortations are given, then specific exhortations. And with the exhortations, there's given several reasons why the believer should be able to obey those exhortations. For instance, when we begin reading the exhortations given in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7, uh, we're told that there are certain gifted men in the local church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers. They're given to the perfecting of the saints uh, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what we're taught here. So God gives certain gifted men in the church to encourage the believers in Christ. He gives certain gifted men to challenge believers to follow the exhortations given uh, in this book. Then, later on in Ephesians chapter 4, we're given another reason why we could obey the exhortations. Number one, we mention because of the gifted men that God has given to the local church to encourage and edify the saints of God. But there's another reason why uh, we could obey the exhortations given in the book of Ephesians, and it's because when a person gets saved, they get a new nature. If you're saved today, you have a new nature. You still have an, the old nature, but you also now have a new nature. And therefore, the Bible clearly teaches that we're to put off the old man. We're to put off that old nature, and we're to walk according to the new nature which re we received when we got saved. And then, that's chapter uh, 4 of the book of Ephesians. Then we move into chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians. And here we have more detailed exhortations and another reason given why saved people can obey these exhortations. Well, number one, the local church was given by the Holy Spirit gifted men uh, to be used to encourage the saints of God. And then... Number two, we have a new nature. Uh, and then uh, here, uh, number three, another reason why saved people can obey these exhortations, it's given to us in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where the Bible says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is given so that saved people can obey the exhortations given by the Lord in uh, his word. In fact, 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So there's no reason why any saved person should fail. Do we fail? Yes, we fail. But there is no legitimate reason why God's people should fail. Now, I can think of many reasons why a person uh, ought to fail when it comes to business. Uh, a lot of people make 
foolish decisions, foolish mistakes, and they fail uh, when it comes to business. I can think of many reasons why a person ought to fail as a professional athlete. One big reason, a lot of people are lazy. And uh, if you're going to excel in your sport, it takes commitment and it, it takes perseverance uh, and, and so many fail because of uh, whatever reason as a professional athlete. Then I could think of many reasons why a person ought to fail as a musician. Now, it takes a lot of practice and dedication to uh, be, be uh, a, a, uh, a musician who excels uh, in that particular instrument. But there's no reason why a person ought to fail as a believer in Jesus Christ. Oh, do we fail? Yes, we fail. But uh, there's no good reason why a person ought to fail as a believer. And it's because everything necessary for our success in the Christian life has been given to us by our Heavenly Father. He has equipped us. Therefore, I have no excuse for failure and neither does any other saved person. No excuse, put the excuses away, it's on us. Now, you and I may fail, and we may make many mistakes, but again, we have no excuse for failing, we have no excuse spiritually for, uh, for making mistakes. Now, in Ephesians chapters five and six, it continues with detailed exhortations to the believer. In fact, the book of Ephesians covers just about every subject a saved person would need to know about in his Christian life. It talks about clean living. It talks about separated living. It talks about the spirit-filled life. Uh, it talks about the relationship between the husband and the wife. It talks about the child's relationship to his parents. It talks about the employee's relationship to the employer. It talks about the employer's relationship to the employee. So God has given us uh, just about everything we know. In fact, all we need to know when it comes to every subject concerning the Christian life. Then, after giving these exhortations, we come to Ephesians chapter 6, and, and specifically verse number 11. Ephesians 6 verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the truth is, many saved people fail. We have failed God. I know I have failed God many times. We have all failed God, but it's not because we do not love God. I know uh, myself, I, I have failed God, but it's not because I don't love God, and I believe it's the same with uh, many of you and many other believers. Uh, you may have failed, but it's not because you do not love God. Many saved people fail because they're unaware of the fact that they have a real, live, powerful enemy working against them. And if they are aware of it, they don't take him seriously. Many saved people make, make jokes about the devil. Uh, many saved people know nothing about what the Bible teaches regarding the enemy. And so they come up with some uh, 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 cute uh, acute sayings uh, concerning uh, the, the devil. Many, uh, many, uh, even by their admission, uh, have a wrong impression of the devil. How many times I know people say it jokingly, but it's almost like they really mean it. They think the devil is dressed in a red suit and carries a pitchfork around with him. I, I know they don't really believe that, but they make a joke like that and, and it just shows that uh, maybe really they, they are not taking the devil seriously. 
Some will say, well, that you know, the devil's in hell shoveling coal to make the fire hotter. Uh, you know, they make a joke, something like that. And we know, you know, they're probably joking ab about it, but this is not a joking matter because the devil is serious about his business. The devil is actually, according to the Bible, the prince of the power of the air. That is the atmosphere even right around our heads. And the devil has access to us as he did to Job in the book of Job. Just read the book of Job and uh, uh, see what, what, uh, what the devil was able to do. The devil has much power. In fact, he had power to strip Job of his entire family, except his wife. He had power to strip Job of his finances. He had power to inflict Job physically. He had power to get Job's wife to tell him to curse God and die. Satan was behind all of that. It's clearly brought out in the word of God. Now, may I remind us that Satan even has the power to fill the human mind with wrong thoughts. In Acts chapter 5, we have the story of a man and his wife who sold uh, uh, their possession and lied about how much they received from the sale. They laid part of it at the apostles' feet. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias... Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie? Now, you get those words? Peter said to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart, thine heart, to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Now, notice that again. Why hath Satan filled thine heart? The word heart here does not mean the physical organ that we have that pumps blood. It means the mind, the very center of a person's being. So the heart here refers to the center of man, which is his mind, the place where he makes decisions. It's his will. It's his intellect. It's his emotions. That's what it means when it says the heart of man. And Peter said to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So Satan has the power to fill one's mind with wrong thoughts and wrong ideas. He has that power. Did you ever have some wild, sinful thought come to your mind just out of the clear blue? Have you ever thought of suicide? Now don't get shocked. Probably just about everybody here at one time thought about suicide. Have you ever been in church? I hope not now. And all of a sudden some wicked vulgar thought comes to your mind. It happens. It does. Well, you know who's behind that? Satan is behind that. Satan has the power to fill one's mind with wrong thoughts. And he filled the mind of Ananias with the idea of lying to God about the amount of money he received when selling his possession. Now, I'm sure Ananias thought that it was his own idea. But Peter knew it was Satan who filled his mind. Peter said it very clearly to Ananias. So Satan has the power to fill one's mind with wrong thoughts and with wrong ideas. And we know that Satan is very subtle. And he's very pleased when he can get people to think that he doesn't really exist. And he is very pleased if he can get you and me 
to not take him seriously. He will work on our minds. And that is Satan's battleground, by the way, with us, our minds. So, knowing this, Satan tries to control our thinking process, the center of our very being. So Satan can plant thoughts in one's mind. Now, those of us who are saved, we have a right to resist Satan, especially when we know it's him. But we won't resist him unless we're aware that it is him who is attacking us. And so, here in Ephesians chapter 6, we read about our battling with the devil. And so, it's very important that we realize that we have a real enemy in the devil, in Satan. And so, it's very important that we understand that. 1 Peter 5 verse 8, the Bible says to save people, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So, the devil has the power to put thoughts into our minds. But then also, the devil uh, has the power to take the word of God out of our minds before it even takes root. Jesus said this in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Have you ever noticed that it's easier for us to remember evil and bad things than right and good things? For example, most older people listening now to my voice can recite this little uh, jingle or commercial. I'll walk a mile for a... Come on now, don't let me down, Brother Mike. I'll walk a mile for a camel. And I, I remember that very clearly. I, I didn't have to study it. I didn't have to memorize it. I, I, just, I, I, I just know it. How about this one? Winston tastes good like a... You're, <laughs> you're giving yourself away. Uh, some of you need to hit the altar now. Get rid of those cigarettes. But uh, anyway, uh, that's right. Uh, how do we remember these jingles? The, you, uh, Brother Larry, you didn't study it, did you? You didn't go write it down and practice it five times a day. It just happens. Now, why is it that we can remember things like that? Why is it that we can remember jingles like that? Now, uh, I know them by memory, and I can get them, uh, and I can't get them out of my mind, no matter how much I try. So, why can't I remember, uh, I can remember all those things, and yet I have trouble memorizing some Bible verses? I mean, I, I, put, I put some verses on a three by five card. I go over them and over them and over them, and then I put the card away, and I need the card. I need to look at it. Uh, why is it? Why is it that uh, I can remember those things, yet I have trouble remembering uh, some good things that were taught to me? One of the reasons is that there is a real devil. And that real devil has the power to take out of our minds the word of God and put in his own thoughts. But wait, if we knew what to do about the devil, I believe that we could live a more victorious Christian life than we now live. So, back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. The Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the words here, to stand against, to stand against is a soldier's expression, meaning to stand one's ground. 
as opposed to retreating. That is not to go back even an inch. So when the devil comes to us with all these evil thoughts and he tempts us or tries to discourage us, the Bible says we're to hold our ground. We're not to retreat. We're not to give the devil an inch. But when the devil comes with all his temptations and pressure, and as a saved person, if we back away and retreat, as opposed to standing uh, our ground, we're going to find that the ground we gave up is very difficult to recapture. That's why we need to not give the devil even, even an inch at all. As we read the book of Psalms, we see uh, there that it took David seemingly a lifetime to gain the ground back where he retreated when the devil tempted him. He prayed in Psalm 51 verse 10, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. He prayed in Psalm 51, 12, Lord, restore the joy of thy salvation. You see, ground lost to Satan is very difficult to gain back. That's why it's so important that the saved person learns to stand his ground against the devil when he comes and attacks. By the way, isn't it strange that we have taken the Bible out of our public school system, but if someone becomes a criminal and goes to jail, what's the first thing we give them? We give them a Bible. We're putting the Bible at the wrong end of this thing. I personally believe that if we put the Bible back in our public school system, we wouldn't be filling our jails as fast as we are since we took it out. And I believe a lot has to do with God's judgment upon this nation. I'm saying tonight, we who are saved need to learn how to fight our enemy, the devil. We need to learn how to resist him. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, there's an emphasis here on the word whole. Put on the whole armor of God. It means use everything God has given us. Why? That ye may be able to stand or to stand our own ground against the wiles, the deceit, the trickery of the devil. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, all of this because of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. The Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So Satan is working on saved people all the time. And if Satan was like most of God's people, it wouldn't be so bad for us. You say, what do you mean? God's people get so discouraged and so quickly, uh, sooner than later, and many of God's people just quit. They just throw in the towel. But I have news for you. Satan never quits. He never gives up. He's the saved person's constant enemy. There's not a saved person who can uh, outlast Satan in his own strength. We may think we've finally gotten the victory, but then he'll come at us at an other, another angle. We need to be careful. And so again, Ephesians 6, verse number 12, it says that our battle is not with flesh and blood, but it says against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Then Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 goes on and says, Wherefore, 
take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Notice it says again, take unto you the whole armor of God. We need the whole armor of God. And then it mentions, uh, it says, to, uh, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. The evil day here refers to the day that we're ferociously and mercilessly attacked by Satan. And he will attack us. And when those times come, God tells us again in verse 13 to withstand. That is, keep on standing. Refuse to back up. Refuse to give any ground. We don't have to give into temptation. I'll say it again. God's people do not have to give into temptation. When we give into temptation, we do it by our own choice. Ephesians 6 verse 14 goes on and says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. We know the Bible is truth. Thy word is truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. The girdle was the part of the soldier's apparel that held together all the other pieces of his armor. That's how important truth is. That's how important the word of God is to God's people. And then it says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. This is not the imputed righteousness of God. This is not the justifying righteousness that a person gets when he gets saved. But this is the believer's own righteousness or his own sanctifying righteousness, our own good living as a saved person. You know, as a saved person, we're to live right. And that is the thing that protects and shields us. You can just think about that. If I'm living right, there's a lot of things that are not going to happen to me if I, I don't live right. Isn't that true? If I don't go to where I shouldn't go, uh, things won't happen to me uh, that would happen if I go to where I shouldn't go. The Bible says that our blessed plate, breast a plate of righteousness is our right living. We're to live right. Living right, being a good Christian, laying aside uh, uh, sins and certain sins. But on the positive side, what is it to live righteously? It's uh, reading the Bible. It's praying. It's being faithful to the church services. It's witnessing, it's tithing. So it's our own righteousness that forms this breastplate. So we see the truth. We see the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6.15, the Bible says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I mentioned this in a recent message. A Roman soldier would wear a sandal that was wrapped around his instep and ankle. And on the, sole, on the sole of that sandal were nails to help his footing so he would not slip. And the footing for the saved person is the gospel. The one thing that helps us to really stand firm is a good, clear, crystal clear understanding of the gospel and the assurance of our salvation. You know that would go a, a long way for the saved person. If I thought that I could lose my salvation, I would have given up uh, long ago because I wouldn't have any footing. My footing is the gospel. My footing is what come may when I die, I'm going straight to be with Jesus in heaven. That's my footing. That's the assurance of my salvation. And if one knows that, one can go on in the face of all opposition. Whatever you're going through today as a saved person, maybe a physical thing, a financial thing, when you know that when it's all over, you're going to go to be with Jesus one day for all eternity in that beautiful place, uh, you can put up with a lot. 
And thank God for that. And then Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. The Bible says, above all, taking the shield of faith. The Roman soldier had a big two and a half by four foot shield. The Bible says, taking the shield of faith. Faith is trust. It's being dependent upon. It's relying upon. Then verse 16 continues, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The idea here is like those old cowboy and Indian movies where the Indian shoots a flaming arrow into the covered wagon and he sets it on fire. Satan is sitting back with his bow and arrow. He sets the point on fire. And guess who he aims at? He aims at the believer. He aims at you if you're saved. He's watching to catch us off guard. Do you know the devil sits out there on your job? That's right. He's on your job looking for a, the ideal opportunity to shoot at you at the right time. We're talking about this real enemy that we have, the devil. He also sits, by the way, in the back seat of your car as you're driving down the road. As that lady cuts you off, he's ready to shoot that arrow and have some bad stuff come out of your mouth. That's the devil. He, he's always ready to shoot one of his fiery darts at us. That's why we need to be alert and spiritually on top side all the time, walking with God, having the whole armor of God on. That's how important it is. That's why we ought to pray. That's why we ought to read our Bible every day and, and, and put on that whole armor of God. Because again, there is a powerful enemy out there, out to get us, out to trip us up, out to ruin our testimony and destroy our families. I'm saying tonight that we have a very powerful enemy. Saved person, the devil has the power to put thoughts into our minds. Then the devil has the power to take things from our minds. And the devil is tirelessly doing all he can to defeat and discourage and depress God's people. However, we do not have to be defeated. We don't have to be downtrodden, no matter what we're going through. Therefore, we must be alert and on our guard. And we must put on, again, the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we're never to back up even one inch when he attacks, but fight and resist the devil in the power of the Lord. I ask in closing, are you saved yet? Maybe someone in the auditorium, maybe someone watching li uh, li through live stream, or maybe even YouTube later on. Are you saved yet? And I say to you, don't put that most important matter uh, off any longer. Ask Jesus to save you, trusting in his shed blood, his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of all your sins, thus also then receiving his righteousness that fits one for heaven. That's for the uh, unsaved person. But then, for the saved person, are we daily reading and studying God's word? Do we have daily closet prayer? These are ways we put on the whole armor of God. Those things are a must for every child of God if we're going to defeat Satan when he attacks. Maybe God has used this message to speak to your heart and my heart. And God wants us and has provided for us in order that we may have a victory in our lives. We don't have to give in to sin. We don't have to give in to temptation. 
and we can have the blessings of God and we can even, even though this is in heaven, we can have a foretaste of heaven even down here as we walk with God. And so let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, the word of God and I pray that all of us have been helped this evening. Bless the invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and turn in your songbooks to page 316 as the words appear on the, the screen for those live streaming. Page 316, I have decided to follow Jesus. Maybe God spoke to your heart and you need to come to the altar for whatever reason. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. 